There's a certain kind of tick, maybe this is all ticks, but there's a certain kind of tick at least that its whole sensory package is just its ability to sense the amount of mammalian skin acid in its vicinity. It can sense differences in heat, right? And it can sense surface tension. It can feel where like the surface is like stretched. Okay. And those senses are so well attuned that that thing can time its jump on you to pretty much get to the vein in your arm and then to like, you know, dip in and start drinking the blood. Okay. But that's all it has. It, like that's its full sensory package. So it's oomba, it's environment, it's world of like, you know, whatever it means for a tick to be consciously aware of conscious awareness is just built around those three properties. Okay, and that's it. Welcome back. I am here with Dr. James Madden. Dr. Hey. Madden. How nope. are you doing? Feel free to call me Jim. Okay. I I always do that too. I always oh. I'm always very respectful of yeah, the, I appreciate it. you know what you had to do to get that. But I'm not okay. I'm not a big title guy. So <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. All right. So you just came out with a book where you the fundamental topic is about hyper objects. Before we start delving into that, and it's about hyper objects and UFOs, essentially. Yeah. How did you get into this topic? Like, what sure. drew you to it? So, uh, the, specifically the UFO topic, right? Right. Cause, yeah, because I'm a guy who was having a perfectly good, normal academic career <laughs> and then got into the UFO thing, right? Did you at least so, get tenure before you got into the UFO thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm a full professor, so I'd be very hard to get rid of just for being weird, right? So, <laughs> right, um, right. Anyway, so I was not a UFO guy until relatively recently. So I'm one of these kind of Johnny-come-latelys that after the big article in 2017, right, in the New York Times kind of piqued my interest, right? So... So there, you know, suddenly we have this institution that everyone supposedly should trust and they're sort of legitimizing it, right? That kind of, you know, as an academic, that kind of, you know, perked me up a little bit and was, a you know, a, a Rogan fan and sort of, you know, heard, you know, right. David Fravor on there and Christopher Mellon. Okay. And then in the summer of 2021, so I mentioned this in the book, even then, I'm like, a, if you looked up all the characteristics of Gen Xers, I'm like a cliche Gen Xer. Okay. Okay. So of course... My kids are teenagers at this point, and so I must show them the X-Files. Okay, so we're watching the X-Files in summer 2021, and there's the big Pentagon briefing, right? Where suddenly, you know, we're not going to say there isn't something to this, guys. And I remember thinking, like, so where was Fox Mulder wrong, right? You know, it was this strange thing, like, well, you know, I had been pretty dismissive of it, and then now... And it's almost embarrassing to say that now these authoritative institutions were telling me it's okay. So now I'm feeling unable to do it. So I'm like, I have to start reading. So I started reading and, you know, I'm reading uh, Jacques Vallée and that kind of like backwards got me into Diana Pasolka's stuff. Right. And then started corresponding with Diana and thinking more and more about it. And then at the same time, I'm writing another book on philosophy of mind, cognitive science stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm really surprised how much potential overlap there is in the two subject fields. Okay. Right. And I'm not finding many people who are who are trained in philosophy of mind, cognitive science, that sort of thing, doing work over in the UFO space, as it were. Right. So I thought I have academic skills. Why not bring them to bear on this? It does seem to me like this is, I mean, not seem, it is an issue now, right? It's an issue that's more or less out in the open. It's an issue that seems to be one of the defining issues of our time intellectually, culturally, scientifically, and should be philosophically, right? And so I think we need academics to come on over and do this, you know? And so people like Diana Pasolka and Jeff Kripal, who are already out there doing that, I saw as examples, right? So that's what got me into it, you know? But one thing I should note is I want to be careful because I'm not saying like now we need to bring in all these academics to correct what the original UFO researchers were doing, right? I, I want to be careful with that because I'm not saying, you know, like it's ours to take and like correct, okay? I, but I, I do think having disciplined tools to bring to bear on it will make a difference. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Now, you've written a recent book on UFO hyperobjects, and I'll put the mm -hmm. link in the description below. What is a hyperobject? Sure. So yeah, the, the title of the book is Unidentified Flying Hyperobjects. Okay. 
So what is a hyperobject? So I think in physics, I believe the term hyperobject is used there, but that's not at all what I mean by it. Okay. Is that term just like a multi-dimensional physical object, i.e. four? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Six dim- yeah. So like kind of flatland, like a flatland yeah. sort of yeah. concept. Yeah, that's, okay. that's what I think it is. Okay. So I'm taking the term from actually an ecological thinker by the name of Timothy Morton, who wrote a book called Hyperobjects. Okay. Okay. And uh, Mor- yeah, Morton's a, a philosopher and a literary critic and writes in deep ecology. Okay. Was this and, the person who was cited in Diana's book as well, Doctor? I think she, I think she does in a, encounters. I think she cites Morton also. Okay. Okay. And you know, one way to explain what Morton's up to with the hyperobject is if there's a recent a documentary that came out, I think 2018, that's narrated by Jeff Bridges in Morton's in okay. it. Okay. That's called Living in the Future's Past. It's an ecological film. Okay. And one of the points they make in the film is, so human beings were evolved, you know, as hunter-gatherers. Okay. So basically, our original cognitive setup was really to not deal with much more than what's going to happen in the next 12 hours. United States and China clash. The world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. Maybe a couple days, right? You know, like you, you get your food for the day, you're good, tomorrow's another day, there's not much to worry about. You're not, like Their orientation into a future is very limited right? Okay. What matters yesterday doesn't really matter as much because now I got to get a meal today. Okay. And think of it like we originally as hunter gatherers, we were evolved to, like to, in terms of space to think of probably never being, you know, more than a few dozen miles from the place of our birth, right? You know, just sort of migrating, you know, within walking distance of everything. Okay. In terms of the number of people we would know, you know, as hunter gatherers, I think isn't the magic number. It's like 80 people is like, maybe, right. And now, okay. And because yeah, the size yeah of there's like, actually a there's actually a word for that too yeah and there's a, like a definite number yeah. but it's very few right okay yeah. so so it looks like we we are cut out to work on a certain scale of things in time and space and social relation and in terms of like hierarchy and things like that okay the film moving in the future's past brings out really well and i didn't see it till after i wrote the book right i wish i had seen it before brings out very well that now we humans are forced to operate on temporal spatial and social scales we were not designed for like we're doing things that have implications for tens of thousands of years in the future right we see ourselves as a part of history that has hundreds of thousands millions maybe billions of years that we're a part of right you know we fly you know all over the world right and we've now some of us have been in outer space and all these things and now our social systems, our economic systems, our political systems are are now increasingly not just city size, state size, country size, continental, global sized systems, right? And the problem is, it seems like these systems now are beyond the scale of what we are actually cognitively, you know, set up to deal with and to understand. Okay. And so what is a hyperobject? A hyperobject is something that is so vast, either spatially, temporally, hierarchically, organizationally, that we can only understand it at its very edges. Like we can only get it at like one small slice of it. Well, I like to put like one tentacle of it that reaches into our world. Okay. Meanwhile, it's operating on a vast scale that we can't fathom in this sort of other world that is is distinct from our way of framing things. Okay. So an example that that Morton uses in his book is, you know, he talks about the environment, right? So, you know, like the environment isn't the snowstorm that we're having today or the rainstorm we're having today. It's this vast system of which that storm is an expression, right? 
the economy, right? You know, the economy, like, you know, it's not this unemployment line. It's not this stock market crash. It's not this, you know, new dividend or something like that. Those are all just expressions of this massive thing, which nobody really has a full grasp on. Okay. And so the idea of hyper object is one that there are things that are just as objective, just as real as the things that we're evolved to deal with. Right. And moreover, they operate at scales that we can't really fathom. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email Through a Glass Darkly ads at gmail.com. And curiously, like we have caused some of these things to come about. Right. Who used the analogy of the tick? Is that so, Timothy's analogy or is that? No, that, that okay, that is, it originally comes from a, a German behavioral biologist from the early 20th century. Where I deploy it, is it comes from Andy Clark, who's a contemporary cognitive scientist. Okay. And so this plays into the notion of hyperopic. So there's this notion that comes up in behavioral biology. It comes up in phenomenological philosophy. It comes up in cognitive science, the notion of an Umwelt. Okay. Which is German would be literally like a round world. Okay. It gets translated in English very often as environment. All right. I don't necessarily like that translation just because it has immediately this kind of like, you know, political environmental <laughs> implications for us, right? But the around world. And the idea is that in a way, organisms create their environment. They create their umwelt. Okay. Because what they do is we evolve in a kind of conversation with the external world where we become attuned to the things that are relevant to our survival, right? And then certain possibilities to be attuned to, you know, become like made explicit by our like showing up and dealing with them. Okay. So like until you have your first, you know, organism, you know, there's no such thing as food, right? There's other stuff, but it doesn't exist as food to have an organism, right? So like the notion of food and the organism come into being together. Okay. So here's the example of the tick. Okay. Following Clark is there's a certain kind of tick. Maybe this is all ticks, but there's a certain kind of tick at least that its whole sensory package is just its ability to sense the amount of mammalian skin acid in its vicinity. It can sense differences in heat, right? And it can sense surface tension. It can feel where like the surface is like stretched. Okay. And those senses are so well attuned that that thing can time its jump on you to pretty much get to the vein in your arm and then to like, you know, dip in and start drinking the blood. Okay. But that's all it has. That, like that's its full sensory package. So it's umwelt, its environment, its world of like you know whatever it means for a tick to be consciously aware of conscious awareness is just built around those three properties. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so the ticks getting the world right. Like you and I do emit this acid, right? We do have you know surface tensions. We do have you know emit heat and such. But the ticks' world, its umwelt, is this caricature of a much vaster thing. Okay. And so I call that vaster thing the Uber Umbelt. Okay. The super around world, the beyond the around world. Okay. So, but we're no different from the tick, right? Like we have a set of senses that have been evolved, like based on what's relevant to our biological needs and eventually social cultural needs and all that. Okay. So what we're getting is a caricature too, right? That we're getting something that's selected based on what's relevant to our species, not the whole. Okay. So relative to us, there's a vast Uber Umwelt, right? Of super objects that are beyond our ken, or at least that show up for us in very truncated ways that have much broader sets of properties that they exist through, right? So connecting it to the hyper object, right? Is what is a hyper object? It's an object that is far, far beyond what shows up in our Umwelt, right? Like, so for instance, to the tick, we would probably be hyper objects, right? Like it, in sensing us to those three properties, it's not getting very much of us, right? Like our being is much more sophisticated than just what you can get mm -hmm. based on the skin acid and the heat, right? But then likewise, the tick might be a hyper object to us, right? Like it too, what we sense about it might be just a mere caricature of a vast set of properties that that thing has, okay? And then the hyper object, like what Morton does with it is to say that it looks like there are systematic things like economies and, you know, the environment, et cetera, et cetera, that take on lives of their own that are expressed to us through very low level caricatured phenomena, but have vast, vast implications that are beyond our ken. Now, how does this compare to the UFO phenomena? 
Yeah. So what I advance in the book is, well, first of all, one point I make initially in the book is to say, look, the notion of the Uber Umwelt or the notion of the Umwelt and the correlate, the Uber Umwelt, these are well-worn ideas already, right? So they're operative in cognitive science. They've done a lot of work there. They're operative in phenomenological philosophy. So when we go to look at the UFO phenomena, right? Mm-hmm. And we're going to look at it as academics, right? We're going to look at it as like seriously, you know, trying to find some kind of explanatory framework for it, right? The less we have to invent on the spot to make sense of it, the better it is, right? And so in the book, I talk about, you know, the extraterrestrial hypothesis versus the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis, okay? So the extraterrestrial hypothesis, all things being equal, has a disadvantage with respect to the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis because you have to explain how the extraterrestrials got here, all these other things. So you're gonna you're gonna have a more complex and thereby less probably true theory than if you start out with things on the earth. You, you see that. Okay. And then even like standard versions of the ultra terrestrial hypothesis, you know, you have to ask, like, well, how is it that this other like breakaway civilization or what have you is hidden from us and all these things? Okay. So once again, you have to start stacking pieces into your theory that are gonna o- lower the overall probability. Okay. Mm-hmm. With the Uber Umwelt notion is, well, one, it's already a well-worn explanatory category, okay? So it's got a lot going for it, so I don't have to argue for it, especially just because it works to help explain the UFO, okay? Two, it doesn't force us to posit the existence of anything that should surprise us, right? So once we admit that our cognitive setups and our perceptual setups are made to simplify the world okay to leave behind more than it brings in because that's how relevance sorting works okay it's not surprising that that there are things that kind of we bump into occasionally that make no damn sense to us whatsoever right Mm -hmm. that are literally alien right to our umwelt to our comfortable around world okay so I think with this notion of the Uber Umwelt versus the Umwelt, I think it helps us bring under one explanatory cognitive blanket here, the UFO phenomena, all sorts of paranormal encounter phenomena, et cetera, et cetera, because it's not surprising, right? That we might bump into other organisms, other living things, right? That make no sense to us whatsoever, okay? Mm -hmm. And in fact, we would at some level expect that, right? If this is how cognition works, all right? So I look at that and say, well, okay, so something that the UFO phenomenon is not surprising to me now. Like all that mammalian skin acid that the tick can sense, that's in the room right now, and I'm aloof to it, right? I have no sensory right. awareness of it, right? Okay, well, then what the hell else is in there, <laughs> right? Like what else is in here that we just weren't evolved to deal with, okay? Now, maybe well, you have, that, well, go ahead, you have Wi-Fi vibrating yeah. back and forth. You have yeah. radio waves coming in. You have yeah. you know, low... And, low grade radiation, like all sorts yeah. of stuff. Right. And, and think of all of that. We then like, we know about Wi-Fi and low grade radiation, all that stuff, because we can refer it back to stuff in our own right? Well, what's in the room that we can't refer back to our own right? Right. So, so it seems to me like nature just got enchanted right there. Like, boom, you know, there's something everywhere and we don't know what it is, which I find is fascinating. Okay. But it got enchanted without our having to posit anything surprising in terms of entities. Did you see why that helps? theoretical yeah. right okay like occam's razor wise this works really well right yeah it's yeah. our perception which is the limiter yeah right okay yeah and it's, so all this stuff has already been here we just aren't aware of it in our you know modes of perception today maybe right. we'll develop better modes of perce- perception later now what about kind of temporal hyper objects so you talked about the ultra terrestrial extraterrestrial mm-hmm. hypothesis what about kind of like a Michael Masters time traveling, yeah. hu- you know, human sort of thing? Yeah, you know, I actually just had the great privilege of meeting Mike Masters last weekend. In person? In person, yeah. Okay. And I told him because I had finished the book before I encountered his work. Okay. And I told him like the one of the flaws of the book is I don't actually include his work. I'm very impressed with what he's done because what Masters has done is he very rigorously comes up with a very probabilistically tight hypothesis for dealing with this right and shows how it coheres well with things that are already known 
et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you do it. That's how you do it, right? So I'm very impressed with his work. Okay. So let, so let me circle back to your question then. Okay. So we've got the Uber Umwelt Umwelt distinction. Okay. And that would tell us it's not surprising that we bump into things that surprise us, right? The one unsurprising thing is that we're surprised, right? Because it seems like always what we're doing is we're limiting the world that is vastly more complex. Okay. Now the hyper object as an, a systematically emergent entity, right? Like in like most of Morton's examples of hyper objects are like that. They're their political systems, their economic systems, their environmental systems, and things like that. Okay. And so you, if you look at it, a lot of what we might call a hyper object is a hybrid between us and something else. Okay. So Morton will mention the Anthropocene, right? Which is this sort of new, a lot of people think that a new geological era has started since the arrival of humans burning things for energy. Like, like literally they can like detect difference mm. in the earth's crust since we showed up. Okay. So people say this is the era of the Anthropocene. Okay. So what happened there though, is like you had an interaction between humans and other things that were in nature that led to this sort of synergy and now you have this other thing the anthropocene that transcends us both and is basically running things now like we can't change that we can't stop that like it's on its own okay so one of the things i float in the book is it could be what we're experiencing with the ufo right in the particulars right you know so think of like a craft that someone might recover or see in the sky you know to use the, like a really crass way of thinking about it right is like a snowstorm to the environment, right? Or a temperature change, an annual temperature change to the Anthropocene. Okay, so we're getting individuated expressions of something that stretches temporally, right, through levels that we can't fathom. Okay, mm. but it's also something that originally began with our interaction with nature. Okay, so going back to Mike Masters. If you throw in the possibility of the time travel thing, okay, so then if hyper objects can stretch not just through, you know, on linear time scales, right, that we can't fathom, why couldn't they stretch uh, across block universe time scales that we can't fathom, right? So I actually think something like what I'm saying fits really well with what Masters is arguing. Okay. And then, what challenges did you have in putting this book together? Okay, well, I think that the number one challenge in terms of just like the, the literal writing of it was the dearth of philosophical literature on the topic, right? Yeah, it's kind of suspiciously absent. Yeah, okay, so I wrote my dissertation on a topic that very few people had written on. It was on a 17th century philosopher named Leibniz, which there's a lot of writing on that, but I wrote... Like the calculus in Leibniz? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I wrote on a topic in Leibniz that like almost no one had written on. Okay. And so I was like, oh, that's cool, because then I won't have to deal with a lot of other people's stuff. Right. Okay. But then I realized as I got my dissertation, but now I don't have anybody else's stuff to help me. Right. <laughs> you know. So I think that was one of the things with writing a book on the UFO was there wasn't an interlocutor for me to like engage with, to like structure a debate with. Because I wasn't aware of another like systematic philosophical approach to it, right? So that actually made it harder to write the book, whereas you know actually not having someone to constrain me that I had to deal with, right? So that was difficult, right? Another thing is I found it difficult simply to be willing to speculate about it, right? Originally, I had just wanted to write something about the epistemology of the issue to say, like, look, we can't rule it out. Here's why, you know, like the evidence is like strong enough to like we can't rule it out. And I ended up actually not doing that. I actually ended up writing very much a metaphysical book about the UFO, right? And so I was a little reluctant to speculate about its nature, right? And I had to just get over that and take the risk to do it. And how did you? Without having an interlocutor, as you described it, how did you solve that problem? Yeah, I you know, I tried to be my own best interlocutor, right? Okay, and your, your own personal devil's advocate. Yeah, and throw and so what I did is I took you know what I thought to be the best. And I'm be careful because I want you know, when you, then you leave people out, right? But like you know, what I thought were the most philosophically rich 
approaches to the UFO. Okay. So I have a chapter that's largely on Whitley Strieber's Them. Okay. His most recent book. I have a chapter basically on Jeff Kripal's Supernature. Right. Mm -hmm. I have basically what is like three chapters on Valet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, where that's my primary dialogue partner. Right. And then I basically have two chapters on Pasalka. Right. And so what I did is I just went with, okay, so I don't have someone I'm arguing against in this, which is how philosophers tend to proceed, right? But I do have conversation partners, right? So I use those figures to frame the debate. Well, let's take Jacques Vallée. And this is, mm -hmm. I imagine this is probably Passport to Magonia, mm -hmm. that book that you're using mm -hmm. for this or any other books that he may. So I, gosh, what do I refer to? I refer to Passport to Magonia. I have a chapter called Magonia is a hyper object, right? The Invisible College, I draw on quite a bit. And I think I draw some on Messengers of Deception and Revelations, too. And where did you kind of come to an agreement with Valet? And where did you yeah. have areas of yeah. know, disagreement or debate? Yeah. So where I came to agree with Valet is I think the control system hypothesis is very, very interesting. Okay. I sort of interpret it in ways that I don't know that he does. Okay. So, you know, valet, you know, in, in the invisible college, right. He says like the one, like he, he's very careful not to get into the ontology of the UFO through most of his writings. Right. He's very careful. And this is because I think he's a, like an epistemically very disciplined man. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not given to ungrounded claims. Okay. But in the invisible college, he will say whatever it is, it is a control system. Okay. It's a control system, right? And I run with that in a couple chapters of the book, okay? Because if you think of it, I'm suggesting that what the UFO is, is more like a systematic phenomenon than it is a single thing, okay? And so what are organisms? Organisms are control systems, right? Like there's no, like this organic whole me, right? There's no like single piece of it that is the organism, right? The organism is the system of control that keeps this stream of life going. Did you see my point, right? So if we ask like, what's the wizard behind the curtain on this organism here? Well, there's no wizard behind the curtain if what you're looking for is something like a single object like this pen. The organism is the system that emerges from, but then controls all the biological parts, okay? And so... I try to make the case then that we might think of the UFO as much more like an organism, right? Than a bunch of disparate individuated appearances of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like what do organisms do? They control, right? Okay. And so I take the suggestion from Valet that look, maybe what it is is through our technological advances, we've entered into a new kind of organic whole, a new kind of control system, right? And with these different appearances of mythology and demythology that Valet likes to point out to us, right? These are essentially like, you know, the hormone mechanisms regulating cells in a large systematic organic entity, right? Okay. So there I take Valet's ball. I'll try to run with it as far as I can, right? Okay. Where might I disagree with Valet? And I think there's only really one small thing that I disagree with him on. And I disagree is he may be too strong. He does, at a couple points, tend to posit a kind of consciousness on the part of this, you know, like that's behind the UFO, right? That Or that's behind the control system or something like that. And I want to be careful with that because I worry about the threat of anthropocentrism there, okay? Because I think when we hear consciousness, we think conscious like us, right? And I want to slow that down. I, I, I would rather go that it's a living that it's alive it has a life of its own right rather than conscious because once again i think we we so tend to anthropomorphize there right and i'm not saying valet is doing that i'm just saying some of the language he uses lends itself to that yeah to overly simplify a potential theory it could just be a mimic right yeah. it just kind of mimics or pulls ideas out of people's heads and you know, mimics is yeah. why sometimes people in the forties would see UFOs with rivets. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, which yeah. No We're sense, not the ball right? for this. It, it shows up. What do we do? We put it into our umvel, right? <laughs> like we put it into what we can understand. Yeah. 
And I do I think Valet's work is really important. He, he, in The Invisible College, he does say, I'm proceeding phenomenologically. And what he means by that is our best clue to what the UFO is, is its effects on us, right? Because in fact, that's all we have really to go on is its effects right. on us. It, it eludes us otherwise, right? So we need to look at like, how does it show up and then cause us to interpret in certain ways? And what does that tell us about what it's doing to us, right? I think that, I think, someday will be what Valet is most remembered for methodologically in studying the UFO. So with all that, what do you think the UFOs are? Yeah. So I'm going to have like, like a evasive philosopher's answers here for you. Okay. I know. That's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think one of the things that the UFO is doing is it's revealing that humans aren't very good at ontology. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that we're actually not nearly as good at answering what are things questions than we might have thought we were. Okay. Because like when we ask, okay, what are UFOs? Immediately what we're going to do is we're going to have to answer that back here in our own belt. We're going to have to like use ultimately some kind of metaphor that's going to relate it to what's in the world we were evolved to deal with. Okay. Which if indeed they're not something we were evolved to deal with, then immediately we're getting it wrong. Okay. Like we're probably doing more damage than we are good in our attempts to answer that. Right. Okay. So I think once you accept that we're like subject to, you know, like influenced by hyper objects beyond our kin, that our perceptual faculties are more here to leave behind than they are to bring in. Right. Which is a feature, not a bug. Okay. Then I ask myself, okay, what is it beyond all of that? Well, I've already set up. That's not really an answerable question for me. Okay. All right. Now, so, and this is this I do take up quite a bit in the book. So, what can we do? Right. Is I think to realize that it is not going to be up to us to figure this out. Right. It is going to be up to this thing to show itself to us. Right. Like that is the only thing that we can do. Okay. So, I think the only way we're going to make progress on this is to kind of constantly be putting ourselves through a kind of deconstructive process, right? Like constantly asking ourselves, when we attempt to answer the question, what is it that is just our human thing we're putting into that? Like, what is it that is just our, you know, sort of contingent cultural moment thing that we're putting into that, right? So we're going to basically end up with what is like a negative theology of the UFO, right? So, you know, negative theology is something you see in Judeo-Christian religious circles where you know, the claim is no positive claim can be made about God. All we can do is like subtract our human claims from it. And like, that's the leftover, right? I have a similar view with the UFO, right? Not that I'm saying it's a deity, but it seems like the best we're going to be able to do is to get very attuned to what is it that frames our world, realize that this thing is not of that world and do the subtractive work, right? So I see it as it's like a never ending work of subtraction that'll have to be done, right? Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like the bombers that flew over Japan, like the ones that returned did not have holes in certain spots. Right. Right. That's the way to put it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay. Right. And so I'm reluctant to try to ontologize it at all beyond that. Right. What do you think is next in this field? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's something cool going on in that we're getting people who wouldn't have otherwise been thinking about this, thinking about it, which I, so, you know, right. So what do you have? You have all these good people who labored for 75 years at great risk to their careers doing this, right? Okay. And, and really they did. Okay. And they took ufology to certain places, right? But then also I think a lot of those ideas became too well-worn, right? Well, there's also a ton of disinformation that was yeah, it's been it's been completely effed with by all sorts of like other influences and stuff yeah. like that. But now, since you know Diana Pasalka, since Kripal, right? It's you know since some of the, the more mainstream revelations, you're getting more and more you know academic people involved with it, right? So I think you're going to have this like whole wave of fresh ideas and fresh takes on it that are going to come in now, right? So I don't know where that goes, right? But I think the field is going to be shaken up in a good way, right? As more people who are outside the traditional UFOlogy get involved, right? When you came out with this book, 
did you encounter any resistance with students or yeah you know uh, uh, other other like yeah. what's your experience with that been so okay so uh, it's funny so i teach at a very seriously catholic institution yeah okay which in some ways makes it easier because you know we're into weird stuff already right yeah <laughs> We've, you know like i mean i'm catholic too so I, uh, yeah yeah fair enough yeah so i had by the way a, do you know dr paul thigpen i know of him i don't know him personally yeah yeah okay all right I, I had a whole episode with Excellent. him about what the Catholic Church, their notions of if there are others out there, yeah. like how it would deal. And it would be fine. It would be totally yeah. fine. Right. Yeah. And because we've been talking about others for a long time. Yeah. But I do think there can be problems there too. We can talk about that. But I had a divisor in grad school at one point who divided philosophers into the ones he said were ontological prudes and those who are ontologically promiscuous. Right. An ontological prude is like a hardcore nominalist materialist who just will not accept anything that they can't see in front of them. And, and ontologically promiscuous would be like these sort of radical Platonists who like has this like universe full of spooky stuff, right? Well, I think Catholics are ontologically promiscuous by disposition, right? <laughs> so, right. So, in some ways, it's easier doing an institution like this, okay? But also, the UFO is not necessarily well behaved with respect to Catholic Orthodoxy either, right? And you know, the appearances and stuff like that, you know, don't necessarily track, right, you know, exactly the religious boundaries that we might expect them to, if you're a holder of a tradition, right? But anyway, so I taught a class here last spring on the UFO, okay, and it was probably one of the most successful classes I've taught in 20 years, right? I think that the young people in the class, and I don't mean to you know, reduce anyone's views, but who would have mostly been seen as religiously conservative people, right? At first, what what has happened to Matt and has he lost his mind doing the UFO thing? But by the end, I think they realized that this was this like incredible trip kind of to the edge of the cave door, right? And I think they really embraced that. Okay. And so I haven't gotten any pushback from my institution. I've found the students are very interested in it, right? I don't know what it will do in terms of like wider academic reputation and stuff like that, but I'm sort of at a point in my life where I just don't care about that. Right. right. Um, yeah. And I think it just, it has to be done because like, even if let's say you're like a Mick West level skeptic, right. Okay. This should trouble you that this is like entering the fray now. So you should be concerned about, I think whether you think there's something to the UFO or you think it's just this like, you know, bunch of hokum, it's becoming such a pressing issue that I think philosophers have to address it from one direction or the other, right? So I was talking to an anthropologist at the University of Chicago just mm -hmm. off offline. Mm -hmm. So he would also float like an idea about teaching a class with his mm -hmm. graduate students. And this weird, weird thing would happen where they would express excitement like oh yeah i would take that you know i would take the hell out of that class yeah. and this and that and then three days later they would kind of giggle and yeah so there's a book by ingo swan called penetration i don't want to get too far out on the limb but it's if there's just something out there that's just this effort to stigmatize the topic and i, I you know i yeah. I, I hope it's dying but well, so one of the things I did when I taught my class in the UFO, and I would recommend anybody who's thinking of teaching on the UFO to, to yeah. pursue this way, is the first book we read was The Psychology of Mass Psychosis by Desmond. Okay. It's a book that came out last year. And he's mostly writing about like issues with the pandemic. Okay. But he's trying to make a general point about how deeply and broadly and, you know, fine grainly we are manipulated. Okay yeah and so that's where i started with my students right is to get them to have a sense to the degree to which issues can be stigmatized and manipulated and so that you dismiss it before you even look into it right and because of the topic it was dealing with these are college kids who had like you know been going to college in the pandemic so they really you know, that was pretty close to it. The, yeah they got yeah, they it they got it their college experience has been like really a lot great. of people still didn't get it like so yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. Reading, so reading that book, like, so one that, okay, that's sort of like, I address the stigma first, right? And to say like, look, like things are stigmatized 
not always for the right reasons, right? And and stigmatization can be a way of social control. Okay, so that's where I started with it, right? Which okay, which really helped. And then we read a book by Bernardo Kasprick. It's his book, More Than Allegory. It's on the epistemology of religious myth. Okay, and what I wanted out of that and worked is to get the students to see the line between you know literal truth and mythological truth and like which one actually gets a grip on reality is a lot foggier than one might think okay so then even if they want to go and say well this ufo thing is just you know it must be like some expression of a modern like psychological issue or something like that well someone like castro helps you see okay so what it still might be showing us something right so that was the next thing we read and then we read some philosophy of technology stuff by a guy named Gunther Anders, whom I cite quite a bit in the book, right? And so what I did is I got them this like potpourri of ideas in place that were going to like legitimize the topic for them independently of the UFO event, right? And to get them ready to like listen to things that they wouldn't have normally listened to, right? And that to me, I think really worked in getting the people ready. And then we read Young's book and Flying Saucer, and then we took off as it were, yeah. And what are their kind of questions did students typically have about, or where was there the most interest when you taught that course, you know, in, in this time? Yeah. I mean, I tell you what Valet does with the Marian apparitions was interesting for my students, right? Because these are miracles, which was, they were already familiar, right? And to see that complicated was, was I think, you know, it, it was very healthy for them, right? Well, say more about that. You're talking about like the miracles at Fatima. And- yeah, yeah. You know, so so you know, Valet. You know, in they didn't read Magonia, right? Where he talks about that quite a bit there. But in Invisible College, he does take up Fatima quite a bit, right? And he talks about how the phenomenological similarity between that and like you, a lot of your very typical UFO sightings is pretty strong, right? And he talked about like a lot of the stuff that like you know we don't talk about you know, happened to those kids and how, you know, things they really never actually said and things like that. And so you start to get this like, well, was Fatima just a UFO, right? Okay. And I push my students on that and say, well, no, 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 no. So these are, anytime I make an identity claim, if I say, you know, Professor Madden is Jennifer Madden's husband, okay. Am I saying he's just her husband? No, he's still Professor Madden, right? Am I saying he's just Professor Bad? No, he's still Jennifer's husband, right? They're one in the same guy. It's not to get rid of either of them. It just turns out they're one in the same thing. Okay. And so that kind of working out the logic of identity, right? If you do have something like, say, Fatima as an example, where it does seem like it's very hard to say that that's a different phenomenon than what a lot of people are reporting about with the UFO. Okay. So then are we saying like we're going to diffuse like the Christian miracles? to privilege the UFO story. No, that's a mythological story. <laughs> right? Okay. Are we saying we're going to diffuse the UFO story to privilege the Christian story? Not necessarily, right? Like what we're saying is there is a very, very, very complex phenomenon beyond our umwelt that is showing up for us and we are experiencing it in under these different descriptions, right? And that's not to dismiss either of them. It's just to point out that it, it seems to like basically, I think, make us take them both seriously because we're saying yeah because it shows up in different places under different descriptions it's harder to dismiss it then did you also cover the blood so case in your course i did not do that yeah that's uh, i know very uh, very similar to the marion yeah i know, sort of I know. Phenomenon. i first looked into the blood so stuff after i finished teaching that course and i thought i'm actually kind of glad i didn't do it because like man that would have been <laughs> very hard to manage in a classroom yeah how so well because it's based on this like individual testimony right and so it's going to be harder like, like something like fatima is a lot easier because like you've got thousands of people on it right, right. and with something like blood so it's like individual testimony although it does seem like he can reproduce it pretty much whenever you want to see it which is interesting oh yeah, yeah. The, the i yeah. mean like the nasa right. the intel the intelligence community has been on he, yeah on oh. him like white on rice for, yeah and so what I mean decade. is like something like Fatima, you've already got this very well attested documented miracle that's hard to dismiss, right? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? That doesn't seem to have the fingerprints of intelligence all over it, too, right? 
Uh, whereas with the blood so thing, that's that would be very hard to deal with and like help you know, in splitting that. Now, probably next time I do the class, I'll probably do it, right? Because I'm reckless. But <laughs> yeah, the fingerprints of intelligence is, you know, is it a psyop? Is it? Yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds like there's stuff really happening down there in terms of being able to not summon, but he can tell when these orbs are going to show up. Yeah. And go did, you, did, you, did you hear his recent appearance on Danny Jones' podcast? Yeah, I have a weird story about that, actually. Yeah, because yeah he, I did. He, he basically, it sounds like he said that, you know, that he went down to visit Danny and they went out to the beach and Bledsoe made it happen. <laughs> right? It was like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I have a weird story about that, which fits into the hyper object thing. I'll just tell it really quick. Sure. It's just weird. Are you familiar with Eric Wargo, Time Loops, that book? Mm -hmm. So if you start kind of recording your dreams, <laughs> you will start seeing things that are precognitive. Yeah. So I've heard, I've heard a lot, a lot of sources. If you look at those records. So that, that interview was one of those. So I had recommended one of my pr prior guests to Danny. I just kind of you know, sent it in or whatever around the same time that I was recording, you know, just writing down dreams. And I have really weird, it just make no sense. Right. But if someone shows up in the dream that just like out of the blue makes no sense. Right. Usually there could be some precognitive element. So as an example, one night I had a dream about the philosophy of the Unabomber. Like, okay. why the hell am I dreaming about the Unabomber? That's bizarre. Might worry about that, yeah. <laughs> the next day, it was trending on Twitter that he had died. Oh, really? So, in this particular case, I had this dream. I'm not going to get into it, but this guy, Andy Bustamante, shows up. Are you familiar with this guy? Mm -hmm. He just shows up in the dream. I, I'm not going to get into the detail about what was there. But I just wrote it down on my you know community tab on YouTube just to record it happened on the evening of september 16th okay on september 19th danny calls you know emails me i have a copy of the email mm -hmm. and he just wants to get on a call so we can arrange you know, he had some questions about this guest that i recommended kind of like a pre-interview sort of thing mm -hmm. so you know i'm just talking to him about this stuff and then i just kind of said you know someone else that you should probably interview is Chris Bledsoe. And he just starts going nuts. He's just like, what is up with all these synchronicities? You're the second person today to ask me to like interview, to recommend that I interview this guy. I'm like, really? Who was the first person? Hmm. Andrew Bustamante. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So again, it's not like super, super insightful and you don't really get any good insights, but there's just, again you're talking about hyper objects there's something there's something in the ether about reality yeah. that we don't quite understand yeah and if indeed we're involved like we're really constituents in systematic entities organisms right that operate on scales beyond our kin i think there too then things like synchronicities and information transfer and stuff like that start to become less surprising right <laughs> right. Yeah. And that, that's for me why the hyper object, like once again, it's this very inexpensive hypothesis in terms of the probabilities involved. Because we already have it in other fields. It's doing work there that pulls together a lot of phenomena in this paranormal UFO space. So I think it, pay, it pays to explore it. Right. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting because if you think about time, right, in our kind of meat suits that we're that, you know, currently in, right, we, yeah experience it kind of in the now but you know across a lifespan it's almost like your future self is communicating with your you know there's there's some level above what we're yeah. capable of experiencing but you know anyway this is all speculative speculation on my yeah part. well even, even you know so this is something i read about quite a bit in my in my other book that just came out thinking about thinking right, is okay so i've been married 22 years Okay, it'd be 23 years next month. Okay. 
And I think that decision was imminently rational to, yeah. to marry a woman. Okay. However, I don't think those reasons were fully privy to me when I married her. Right. And in fact, I don't think it, you can. It, it is fascinating you say that because I, what's today's date? In 10 days, it's my 25th. Really? Anniversary. Yeah, I'm I'm close to Yeah, that's awesome. But if it's the same thing, it's yeah. the same thing. I just knew. Yeah. I just knew. You just knew. And so like, like, how could you even really give reasons for marrying someone until you've been married for like 10 years, right? Like you don't know what the hell you're doing. Right. Right? Okay, so I, ha- I have a, a strong externalist view of mind where I think much of what our cognition is offloaded into environments, okay? And so those reasons for my marrying, right, were not internal to me at that point. They were in my umfeld, my shared environment. They were in the family that I lived with. You know, I, I grew up in. They were in the church I belonged to. They were in the friends I had and all these things, okay, and the history that I've inherited, all those things, okay. And I wasn't first order aware of them in as much as I am now until like 22 years later, until I really understood marriage. And I really understood this person and me and all the things that we would do. And now looking back on it, it all makes sense. Right. And so I think sense making really only happens retrospectively. Okay. Right. And so it's as if the future, like the, the 2023 Jim Madden was deciding for the 2001 Jim Madden. Right. And I think once again, if you start, if you go block universe and time, if you go hyper object, how I have to do it, then that's not just a metaphor. That's maybe literally true. Right. And it's also, it's an intuitive decision. It's not necessarily an intellectual right. decision. Right. I mean, like we like most to, decisions. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We like to kid ourselves that we have intellectual reasons for things, yeah. but mostly it's just to justify intuitive decisions that we already have. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, I think that's. Uh, as good a point to to stop as as cool. any cool but congratulations for being married for 23 years yeah thank you yeah thank you yeah congrats to you too man yeah, yeah it sounds like we chose well because yeah exactly yeah i yeah I, don't, I hope my wife did but i think i did <laughs> yeah well i don't know if my wife did but i i got the better part of that bargain yeah. so all right my friend it's been a pleasure cool If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me a Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me a Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.